beautiful morning here in uh, Seattle, and um, we are going to be playing some Der Weltkrieg today, a uh, 3v3 game. We're going to be doing um, the Eastern Front um, and possibly the Balkans. We haven't figured that out yet, uh, but uh, we're going to go with this as, I think, weekly as long as it takes to finish, so it should be pretty fun. I'll be showing you uh, some of the game as we're playing um, and some of the situations that come up. I actually don't know what section of the Eastern Front I'm going to be playing personally yet. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna figure that out. Um, but as you can see, really great location for this. I'm gonna be somewhere. Let's see, somewhere over in this building over here, um, uh, on the water. Uh, just perfect temperatures today. Um, the the day has not started as well as I would hope. I as I got here, I stupidly locked my keys in my car. Uh, so I am now waiting for AAA to come help me with that before we get started. Everyone's up there waiting for me. So uh, just I am the most awesome teammate. If this is the way that World War One is going to begin with this level of snafu, um, I feel bad for my teammates pretty much. So uh, let's get going. All right, we're an hour in, still haven't started playing, but uh, we fixed the first problem that we started today. The next problem is going to be how do I uh, defeat the Serbians? Because it looks like I have drawn the Austro-Hungarian front uh, in the south, and I will show you the map here in a minute. But um, we've got a German player in the north, we've got a Russian player in the north, we've got an Austro-Hungarian player in the north, we've got an Austro-Hungarian player in the south, that's me. Um, and then we've got a Russian South player who we are combining right now with a um, Serbian and Romanian player. So it should be pretty interesting. The maps, uh, we've got them pretty much aligned and uh, I'll show you that right now. What, what's Richard going to do? He will take Serbia when he returns. Or will rearrange. And Kent, you're doing Russian North, is that right? Yes, that's all that's left over. Nineteen fourteen. Let's go. All right. So uh, we're, as I mentioned, uh, I picked up the uh, Austro-Hungarian invasion of Serbia uh, for some reason. Uh, I'm playing this nightmare again. If you watch the Serbian, the Serbian playthrough I did on this channel. Um, so uh, first turn of the game. I've just completed the movement here. There's just like some real crappy terrain along uh, <clears throat> along this advance into Serbia, and uh, I am forced to now make attacks uh, out of supply range uh, on the first turn by the game rules uh, of this HQ all along the sort of Western Serbian front. Should look very familiar to you if you watch the Serbian the Serbian playthrough. Uh, so that's where we are, and as, as I zoom out and you see the absolute scale of where we're at here, I'm um, just waiting for my opponent to come back, and he we're going to roll some dice against each other. What does he move next turn? Next turn, yeah. um, I get the first army, which is, I think, this one. You're allowed to move. Yep, and the turn after that I get this one, and the turn after that I get this one. Oh, I see. So okay. there's not a lot happening. I'm not going to move those. Okay, finishing up uh, here. We're almost at the end of August. We played probably three or four turns today. Uh, the Austro-Hungarians making pretty good progress into Serbia. The Serbians have very nicely and gentlemanly agreed to retreat uh, back into the homeland to allow the Austro-Hungarians uh, some space to, to maneuver. We finally got across this river here into this really shitty, rough terrain, uh, and kind of trying to split the Montenegrins from their friends, the Serbians, uh, in this part of the map. Um, I have not been involved in the rest of this, but uh, here where you can see Galicia is underway. The Austro-Hungarians were obligated to make some just terrible attacks in some of these... Uh, positions against like huge Russian force. Um, you can see this die here is actually indicating that the Austro-Hungarians just took four strength point losses from an attack they had no business really making other than that the high command demanded it of them. Uh, and then uh, here in uh, around Konigsberg, the Russians uh, actually playing pretty conservatively and not really putting a lot of pressure on the Germans up here uh, towards the city. However, down here they are trying to outflank and the Germans have had to kind of uh, block off this approach on the flank of the Masurian Lakes. So uh, we are going to reconvene in a couple weeks and... Um, actually in a week. In a week, excuse me, thank you. But uh, that's, what the, that's what the state of things looks like here. Uh, pretty epic scale and uh, we're just getting started. 
Well, for you, it's only been several seconds. For me, it's been a week, and we are up early, early-ish again on a Saturday to go play some uh, Der Weltkrieg and uh, continue the campaign. So let's get on with it to Seattle. Let's resume some World War One, shall we? So, oh, I'd still have to fight the force, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think your sea care killer is doubled if there's no more There's no more I remember that. Yeah. While I'm waiting for my opponent to uh, finish his uh, conflict with my teammate up in the north, as the battle for Galicia rages on, um, down here I thought I would explain the combat system a little bit, just because it's kind of interesting and pretty simple. So we've got these tile spacers on units that I'm planning on attacking this turn. As you can see, the Austrian's in a good position. Um, but the way the combat system works is actually very simple. So first of all, you look at the terrain, um, and the terrain uh, has a DRM for the attacker and a DRM for the defender. And that is because in this game, when you make an attack, the defender always gets to roll against you in counterattack. And frequently, that is going to be at triple their combat strength to mimic sort of the World War One defensive advantage. So uh, in this particular example, even though I have a bunch of units piled up here to attack, this unit is actually going to uh, counterattack me at nine rather than three. Unless I make him retreat, and that is based on the number of hits you do as the attacker first. So there's this really interesting interplay between attacking, seeing what happens, and then the defender having to either retreat or not, and then that counterattack being really powerful against you, which is really cool. And because this system is, is a fully strength point based system, the combat table is actually very easy to read. You look across at how many strength points you have in the attack, you roll a d6, apply modifiers, that's the number of hits you do. And it's the exact same for the counterattack. They would look at the column they're at three times, whatever their strength is, they do a number of hits back to you. You take some manpower losses, you flip your counters, and you're done. And it's uh, based on a single d6. So uh, it's a very cool, very fluid, very fast moving, and very interactive combat system that. Uh, really keeps the game going rather than getting bogged down into a bunch of uh, calculations and table references. Uh, 12, and you get to choose the river column, broken, you, it has, it, I thought, am I half if I attack across the river? No, it's, um, all units have to be attacking across okay, the river. so I'll throw him in as well, 15. Yep. That's another, and, but you get to use broken, which I think is minus, minus one. one. Yeah, minus one. So, yeah. What's the odds? I've got 15 and you've got four. And there's one up, minus one of the dice. My roll. <laughs> the Austrians <laughs> flubbing it. So I score one hit on you. Okay. And you counter it. You don't have to retreat because that's only one in four. Ah, uh, this is an encirclement attack. There's something funny about encirclement attacks. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, if he's surrounded in a pocket, right? Yes. Surrounded units. Um, this is the uh, Serbian front right now. Pretty heavy pullback by the Montenegrins. Pretty heavy pullback by the Serbians in the face of uh, the intimidating <coughs> versed powered Austro-Hungarian army. Um, <coughs> he's got some bigger stacks here now, so it's going to be harder to make progress at this point, but I'm pretty happy about that. Belgrade's the main target right now. And then I roll on one column, and I get plus one. So we got some Russians six. and Austro-Hungarians fighting up there. The, the real benefit that the Austro-Hungarians have is they have not had to send uh, any of the second army up to that front uh, so because my partner player in the northern front of Austro-Hungary, Austria-Hungary, has not needed them as of yet, although he's getting a little thin on the defense over there, it sounds like. So uh, this may be the last turn that we've got to uh, really accomplish our objective, which is get into the city. Germans and the Russians have been pushing uh, around Konigsberg, and it looks like the Germans now sort of in the upper hand here. They've managed to push the Russians back, Konigsberg being here. Big stack, though. They just had a pretty large combat of the Germans getting back across the river. But we think that the Germans are vulnerable here to the Russian Second Army. Seem to be kind of a thinner line of defense. And Galicia looking a whole lot like Galicia. My, uh, my allied player is starting to sweat a little bit as he retreats into the Carpathians about needing that second army reinforcement, but I am so close. So close. This turn we're going to be attacking into the suburbs of uh, 
Belgrade. Well, we've done it. We've taken the first urban hex of Belgrade here finally uh, into the early September. Uh, and doing so used all of the Austro-Hungarian supply. So the Serbian counterattack is going to be uh, real interesting over the next couple of turns. Russians getting uh, a bunch of reinforcements now, hopefully to stem the tide. Germans, uh, been some pretty big battles on both sides. Lots of losses, lots of demoralization. Uh, you can see the 10th Army is coming into play here in Warsaw, and the Russians making a push here south of the Masurian Lakes to get to Konigsberg the other way. This is what the uh, this is how we're storing the game between sessions, in case you're curious about that kind of thing. There are these wonderful racks. There you can see Serbia, there you can see the, the um, Tannenberg front, and they are all stored in these massive racks where we're playing the game. Very nice. Lots of other games underway as well that are being stored here. Okay, well, that's the conclusion of our session today. I really like this system. I know I've said that before in many videos, but uh, it's super playable. Um, it really gets you into the decision space without a ton of overhead. And, um, you know, it's been a little bit slow going and you'd expect that from World War I, but um, uh, I think it's been a really uh, good way to spend some time. I'll see you later. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, we finished the second session. We've gone a month into the game and uh, I feel like the uh, Central Powers is doing quite well. And as we all know, uh, World War One ended in at the end of 1914. Everyone was home by Christmas with a Central Powers victory, right? Yeah. <laughs>